You know, Liberty Mutual Insurance customizes car insurance so you only pay for what you need. You know what? Honestly, that's all we really want. You know, fairness. We want it in sports. We want it in life. It's all be treated fairly. And what's more fair than having you only pay for what you need? Way to go, Liberty Mutual. This message was brought to you by Liberty Mutual Insurance Company. Visit LibertyMutual.com to learn more. I want to remind you before we get started that TickPick is the exclusive ticketing partner of Purple Insider and the Blue Wire Network. TickPick should be your first choice to buy football tickets because they save fans money by never charging service fees ever. Welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here, and we welcome into the show Monday Morning Murph. This is our debut. Brian Murphy, former Pioneer Press columnist who put out his first column on Purple Insider today. And uh, it was very fun to read you back breaking down Minnesota Vikings football. Brian, how are you? I'm great. I mean, they just make it so easy, don't they? Uh, yeah, if, uh, you wanted it set on a tee to drop some one liners on the Vikings, uh, they really did it for you yesterday. I mean, I I will say, Brian, I've never seen a team jump off sides three times on the first drive or really any drive. I mean, that is, it's literally the opening to the obituary, right? I mean, (laughs) how bad can you, how bad of an omen can it be when on the very first snap of the season, you commit a false start? I mean, you could hear the eyes rolling across Minnesota already. And then to commit three more penalties in the opening series, uh, which portended to what? What I think it was 12 accepted, was it? And 15 overall, Uh, 70 yards of which were pinned down the offensive line. Every offensive lineman had at least one flag. Most had multiple and they were false starts, illegal formations, uh, one unnecessary roughness completely undisciplined the fact that they were even in overtime just blew me away you know I think that here's what I want to do with with this conversation is I want to talk about like what's going to carry over going forward what's not going to carry over from week one because it's always a strange week in the NFL and what we should be overreacting to if you will and what we shouldn't be overreacting to and I think that the false start penalties well bizarre and for sure like you said not exactly the feeling everyone wanted on the first play from scrimmage I don't think that's going to be a problem going forward I do think though that the holdings are going to be a problem going forward because you play Chandler Jones and J.J. Watt this week and then two weeks from now you're taking on Miles Garrett and Jadavion Clowney like this doesn't get easier for your offensive line and if they're not giving up sacks, then they're holding and tackling the guy on the way there. I, I just don't know what the fix is. Like a Christian Derisaw getting healthy, maybe, but he's never played in the NFL before. Uh, they don't have some, you know, they drafted Wyatt Davis, but he doesn't seem to be ready to play guard. Uh, Garrett Bradbury had another very poor PFF grade in this game. Um, so he continues to struggle with guys who push him back into the quarterback. Like, I don't know what the fix is once you get to the point where you see, oh, okay, this offensive line is just really not going to be better than it was. Well, you know, to quote the venerable and late great Denny Green, they are who we thought they were. I mean, these were the question marks everybody was asking during the offseason before they drafted Derrissaw and certainly throughout training camp. How is this patchwork offensive line, you know, 6.0 under Spielman going to protect Kirk and make him as comfortable as can be? Because we all know Cousins, heaven forbid he has to improvise, you know, all the analytics point to disaster in in the making. But if he has a clean pocket, he can, you know, he can run and gun out there. So I, I don't see and and where's the confidence level? As you meant, you I mean everybody had an awful game on that line. I mean Rashad Hill, who obviously moved outside, uh, was clearly out of position and being manhandled. You could just tell that uh, I don't know the end that he was going up against was in his head. I mean I don't know how many holding calls he had, but he was trying to overcompensate, committing the fouls. So you got to wonder where the confidence level is with him. You got to wonder where. I mean, you can almost see on the screen 
Kirk Cousins looked panicky back there. Like he did several times, uh, didn't know whether he was going to get out alive. Uh, and you know, Mike Zimmer never, never missing an opportunity to passive aggressively slam his, his QB tells the uh, Jenny Taft on the sidelines at halftime that, you know, cousins is holding the ball too long. Well, that may be the case, but I think he just sees the world collapsing around him. And I also think he, he feels like I, this is a yearly problem here. I don't have a lot of trust. I don't have a lot of confidence in my protection and I don't see it necessarily changing. I mean, I don't know if there's enough solutions in the building. Again, you mentioned the false starts as in coach speak, that can be cleaned up easily. Right. Uh, You're right. The holding, uh, the footwork, the slowness and the confidence, that's going to be a a week to week uh, uh, joy ride or not joy ride, but, you know, scary ride to see what these guys can do. I just wonder if if it's baked in right now into that locker room that there's just not a lot of confidence in the offensive unit as a whole in the pass protection. So I'm looking at the PFF grades. They get them out uh, right away now on Monday morning for what they thought of yesterday's performance. And it's just exactly what you'd think. Like Brian O'Neill was totally fine. His pass blocking grade was 79.6. Now it's on one to a hundred scale. 65 is about an average performance or you did fine. Anything over 65, you did fine. Anything over 80, you did great. Uh, So Brian O'Neill, 80, he's fine. Ole Udo, 59. Uh, Ezra Cleveland, 49, Rashad Hill, 47, and Garrett Bradbury with an incredible day for a center, 27. He had four pressures allowed, which... He ought, he ought to be paying Cousins for lap dances because he's constantly <laughs> on top of them. <laughs> and, and not only that, but he had two penalties as well, and Rashad Hill had three penalties. I, I mean, th- the Garrett Bradbury thing you're going through his seasons here and you're thinking, all right, well, at some point he'll sort of figure it out. Centers take a while. And then he immediately comes out. And like you said, is pushed back right away into the lap of Kirk cousins. And when we talk about the unknowns going into the season, will this guy improve? How will this work out? That's one where I think we know right away, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. So now the question is, how do they fix this as they go into a suddenly very important game, right? Yeah. I mean, they're looking, look, Cardinals look great yesterday against Tennessee. They're on the road again. They got to make a long trip out West. And if they lose that game, suddenly you've got Seattle coming in for your home opener. And I don't know, what are they? Oh, and four, oh, and five against Russell Wilson, who, oh, by the way, torched Indianapolis for four touchdown passes yesterday. I mean, 0-3 is very, very viable at this point. And it could get really ugly really quickly. Uh, I I think that we've all read and and heard, and you guys have been chronicling the the rising tensions, not only between Zimmer and his unvaccinated quarterback, but just with the the offense, uh, with whether or not Zimmer has the personnel he wants from his GM. And, you know, you you can already see the uh, the plausible deniabilities and 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 the the scapegoating kind of laying laying the seed work here for everybody's going to have a reason for why this went off the rails, but the stakes are incredibly high right now for Spielman, Zimmer, and Cousins. The fan base is perpetually on edge, but they did nothing yesterday to to talk fans off the off the ledge. I, you know, zero and one, starting out zero and one on the road is is not usually catastrophic in the NFL. Now you got 17 games. You can even make up for that. But with this team in this market, with this history and this personnel and these people running the show, it just feels like there's just not a lot of room for error at all here in the next few weeks. Right. And one of the problems with this game and losing it is that Kirk cousins actually played pretty well. And you want to win and give me captain obvious here, but like you want to win every game in which Kirk cousins plays pretty well because 
there's only going to be so much, so many of them every year. And we just know this. It's just facts of life with Kirk Cousins, right? It's if your offensive line falters, if you're behind the sticks, you're not going to be able to overcome it with Cousins. We know that there will be some games where it just isn't there, where the defense is too good or where he just has one of those Atlanta Falcons, Buffalo Bills games. Like those things are on the way. So when your quarterback especially in the second half of the game is mostly good and gives you a chance to win. This is how it's always felt with this team, even going through training camp and preseason is that the margin is thin. So you can't fumble if you're Delvin cook now fumbles happen and that might not have been a fumble, but you can't have a call go against you. And the, the, the frustrating part about talking about this team that I, I I'm almost hoping it changes here because it's become like monotonous to go back over these things. And this sort of felt like the game in Kansas city when Matt Moore started instead of uh, Patrick Mahomes, it was like, okay, you should win this game. And Kirk wasn't too bad. And he gave him a chance, but then one thing went wrong and you lost. And you know, now what? Like you just have no ability to kind of make up for these things, which makes their kind of have a, or makes me kind of have a feeling of inevitability about this team. Well, think about it, too. We, we, we talked about it for yeah every week that Cousins has been here. Look at his numbers. 350-plus yards, two touchdowns, no picks, you know, over 100 passer rating. And what Vikings fans have been waiting for and dying for is to, to, to have the ball in Cousins' hands with less than two minutes, no timeouts, and the game on the line. Well, what did he do yesterday? He delivered. Nine plays, 60-some yards, no timeouts, very nervy getting them down the field, completing a key fourth down, I think it was fourth and four, to to K.J. Osborne at midfield uh, to keep it alive, getting the ball down the field, getting up to the line, spiking it, setting up Joseph's tying field goal. That's a clutch quarterback play. Now, they didn't do anything with the ball, uh, at least on their their own offensive series, in overtime, Uh, and and especially after Cook fumbled. You know, you you, you could see them. I I thought, here's what I thought the storyline was going to be. Joseph comes through in the clutch to force overtime. Joseph, with a chance to win it in overtime, he goes wide left. That's what <laughs> I thought this was yeah, heading. It ends up as a tie. Uh, right. I thought Cook, tie was coming too. Delvin Cook, we thought he had solved his fumble problems. And look, it was a very borderline call. Uh, you know, called a fumble on the field. Fox couldn't find the right angle. The Vikings, you know, lost in both of their reviews. I mean, the first one really only cost them one play and a Justin Jefferson touchdown. It did cost them a key timeout, but hey, Cousins overcame that and they were able to tie it to force it in overtime. So that's a wash. This one, again, borderline. Uh, but as you mentioned, if you put yourself in a position where you have zero margin for error, not every replay call is going to come in your favor. What are you going to do about it when it doesn't? And the worst possible time to fumble, the worst possible time to hand the ball back to the Bengals with obviously their rookie big leg kicker. These are the problems that are going to plague the Vikings. Offensive line play has to be perfect. Pass protection has to be perfect. Cousins pocket has to be perfect. Cook can't fumble the ball. And yet, and you know, we may pivot to this in a minute, but I think the only reason we're even talking about the Vikings even being in this game in the second half was because of, Zach Taylor's harebrained decision to go for it on fourth yes. and one at his own 30 with a 14 point lead. Now I read his quotes. He was looking for the dagger and that would have been bold, but there was no indication that the Vikings were going to overcome Cincinnati's pass rush. There was no indication that the Vikings were going to score 14 points in the last, you know, 20 some odd minutes. They just spoon fed them momentum. Thielen gets his second touchdown pass. Suddenly it's a game again. And, I mean, we wouldn't have been watching this game for three hours and 40 minutes if Taylor doesn't make that decision. So, in in reality, the Vikings were gifted a chance to maybe ring out a tie at worst. But instead, they fumble the ball, Cincinnati wins, and the recriminations have begun already. I thought about that quite a bit, that Cincinnati not only gave them a chance there, 
but they also gave them a chance with the way that they handled their offense so conservatively. And Joe Burrow said that he had an ankle thing in the second half of the game. So I think they were trying to protect his ankle, but that's a good break for the Vikings that allowed them to be more aggressive and uh, have Cincinnati have three and outs or very short drives and continue to punt the ball back to the Vikings and give them chances. And it's funny how a game that ends up getting to overtime that you trailed the whole way ends up looking really close, like a back and forth affair. And in some ways it was, but the other team kind of said, why don't you make this really entertaining for your fans? And if they get, you know, Joe Mixon falls down on that play. If he lunges forward for the first down, it probably is over. And maybe we're talking about them scoring on that drive. And this is a blowout and this is an even a uh, very close game. I mean, that decision I thought was, uh, I know analytics people maybe thought, well, not 50, uh, 50. I saw somebody saying like 50, 50 with the analytics, but the way the game is going matters. So that's like a broad thing, but the way the game is going matters. Your defensive line is murdering the Vikings offensive line. And if you punt that away, they're having to go 85 yards again or something. And, and they, they just weren't doing that very often uh, in this game until they were down by two scores. Now here's where I want to draw back to the quarterback though, because, this is the thing about Cousins. We always say, well, you know, it needs to be perfect for it to work out. And I want to put a specific number on this, that yesterday they were in a lot of second and longs, a lot of third and longs, thanks to everyone who is fat on the offense. But Cousins' average depth of throw was 5.8 yards. That was the third lowest in the NFL of quarterbacks who threw more than whatever, 20 passes. The third lowest. Like he was not pushing it at all. And check down Charlie, right? Of, of course, Cincinnati is going to be playing back on second down in 20, but it's the NFL in 2021. I mean, it, you're, you so often let opponents dictate what they want you to do. And the lack of aggressiveness, I thought, open the door for Cincinnati to take the lead early, open the door for Cincinnati to come through at the end of a half and get up in the game. And I just wonder, like, can you win a game that Delvin Cook is not dominating the other team? And the answer has turned out mostly to be no. And even if your defense is a little fragile at, at any point in the game, makes one mistake, has one pass interference penalty, it just, it just seems to all come apart. And I've got a, another great stat for you, Murph. The Vikings, yep. when they give up 25 points or more over the last three years, are 3-17-1. And, and I'm sure you're saying, well, lots of teams are bad in that circumstance, which yeah. is true. But league-wide, teams win one in four of those games. That's 14% for the Vikings. The Kansas City Chiefs win more than 50% of those games, and so do the Seattle Seahawks. And, mo and most of the good teams win about 40% of those games. So it really shows you, you have to have a great defensive performance. You can't turn the ball over. You have to have Delvin Cook running. You can't commit penalties, or you're just going to get short completions that pump up completion percentage. And it's just, this is how you have to win. End of story. That's a lot of you can'ts right. to stack up right. one after the other. I read, I thought one of the stats that was really telling, and, and obviously this was a byproduct of Cook not really being able to establish the run early, and also the, the just nonstop uh, flag show against the Vikings offensive line. I think through three quarters, their average third down attempt was about third and 12. Yes. I mean, that's completely unsustainable in the NFL. It was, You're not lo it was longer than that. I think that. it was like third and was 20. It? Yeah. It, it was third like and 20. Yeah, okay. Some, it might something. have been, it might have shrank as the game went yeah. on. But Zimmer yeah. said the at, first, in, in the third, early in the third quarter, it was like third and 20 or something. I mean, you know, that's, that's a death now. I mean, yeah. you're not going to go anywhere. I mean, you're going to be, you know, trying to get 10 yards and punt. Uh, so it did. Again, we all know Mike Zimmer. He loves his running game, right? He loves to think it's 1985. And he's got one of the most talented and bruising running backs in the NFL. So let's exploit him. But when it does grind down, when there are penalties, when there are issues, it literally grinds to a halt. And then you have to pivot into something that you may not be comfortable being, which is we need to be a downfield team suddenly. Well, other teams are going to pretty much adjust to that too, and they're going to they're going to taunt you and challenge you to do that. And we're still sort of waiting on that. Will Cousins break out with a 500-yard game with bombs? I don't know if that's feasible within the system. I don't know if it's feasible behind this offensive line. 
And I certainly don't, it's never going to happen. Uh, if you're, if you're constantly playing uphill all afternoon. Right. Right. And if you get ahead in the game and Delvin is running successfully, you can just win. I, I mean, that, yeah. that, that run just, out the clock and right. play great defense. And, and there you go, but you have to get to that point and they can't seem to get to that sweet spot, that comfort zone where they're dictating play. They're dictating the terms. It always seems like the terms are being dictated to them. And that's where they don't always uh, rise to the occasion. So I'm looking at this the way that they started the game yesterday. It was, of course, the false start. First and 15 is a short pass to Delvin Cook. They get a first down. It's a handoff to Delvin Cook. We go to the next drive. It's a handoff to Delvin Cook. We go to the next drive. It's a short pass to Delvin Cook. Like, they are not really using Justin Jefferson early in games, which I think is is frustrating. Uh, What else does he have to prove? Well, and, and every time they get behind, they go to Justin Jefferson and he makes big plays. And I think that, you know, when you look at, like, how can you get the absolute most out of your offense? I don't expect any team in the first week of the season to just come out and throw three straight 50-yard bombs to Justin Jefferson. But I also don't think that the ratio should be three Delvin Cook plays to every one Justin Jefferson play. They're both superstar players. I would never say don't give the ball to Delvin Cook. It's just this team has this philosophy of coming out and throwing the short pass and running the ball and not, like you said, not dictating terms right off of the the get-go and not taking the shots and not pushing the ball down the field early. And I, I just don't know how successful that can be when anything ever goes wrong. And then you're forced to play from down two scores. And so now you're playing quarterbacks, Kyler Murray, Russell Wilson, and Baker Mayfield in these next three games. And then, you know, they go to Carolina before the bye, too. And I noticed Carolina's defensive line really ripped apart a bad offensive line in New York. Um, So even though I don't have much respect for Carolina, they at least do have a, a decent defensive line. They drafted a, a couple of guys high there. So this isn't going away and this isn't changing. And then so I think we're forced to be in a position, Murph, where we're like, well, what now? Like, what do we say about them now? When we think we have all of the answers for this team already in week one, but then you have to pull yourself back and say it is only week one. So what now? Like I saw a lot of fire everybody and that sort of thing yesterday, but I I guess that, well, that's my question to you is like, what now? Well, is Owen one your identity? I mean, most of the features we saw yesterday and we've just broken down are, you could have, we could have had this conversation uh, in September of 2020, uh, November of 2019. Uh, We could probably go back three or four more years too, even before cousins got here, the same issues, uh, not establishing the run, not getting good pass protection, not taking advantage of opportunities, giving things away, not necessarily the football. I mean, obviously, Cook's turnover was at the worst possible time, but otherwise they protected the ball well. But they didn't rise to the occasion against a supposedly inferior opponent. And they don't have – there's no gimmies in the NFL. We all know that. But there are some wink-wink gimmies. And this was one of them. Uh, the Cincinnati Bengals, as far as we know, at this point should not be beating the Minnesota Vikings the way that they did by watching the Vikings implode. Now you're going on the road against another team that seems to be turning things around. It's a long trip. Uh, It's a tough start to the season. There's going to be a lot of negative energy hanging over the, the facility this week. I, I just wonder where the psyche is of this team. And again, we don't know because I mean, you guys don't even have access to the locker room. Not that that reveals everything, but I'm wondering where the internal divisions, confidences, uh, where's the cohesion, how long that can stay together, um, because you've got a lot of external things already pushing down on them. Um, you've got the Delta variant sort of lurking in the shadows. You've got three key players that we know of besides Cousins. We got Thielen and Harrison Smith who are unvaccinated. When is that shoe possibly going to drop? How is that? going to play when it comes out publicly there's going to be a lot of i told you so's out there there's going to be a lot of a vibe you know zimmer has made it clear that this is a shotgun marriage with cousins and the tension is thick uh he doesn't waste any opportunity to ding him along the way how much longer is that going to roll off cousins back if it even does anymore i i just 
the externals are things that need to be paid attention here because you can always say we're going to go into the film room, we're going to clean some things up, we're going to work on crowd noise, we're going to work on the false starts, we're going to work on technique, hands, footwork for the line. We're going to maybe mix a few more things in here and there on the offense. Defense played fairly decent yesterday. Um, but at a certain point, there's a lot of other uncontrolled factors that are going to be playing here. And, oh, by the way, you've got opponents that probably look at the Vikings now as the Vikings maybe looked at the Bengals yesterday as a vulnerable opponent. Folks, Minnesota football is back, and there's no need to exhaust yourself searching all over the Internet for Minnesota football tickets anymore because TickPick, that's T-I-C-K, P-I-C-K is the original no-fee ticket site and the only one you'll ever need to go for NFL tickets. TickPick got rid of all those awful service fees like the other ticket sites charge, which lets them guarantee the best prices of all of their NFL tickets. Don't believe it? If you can find better prices for the same seats on another ticket site, TickPick will give you 110% of the difference on your purchase price. We've got quite a slate of home games in downtown Minneapolis, including revenge game for Cleveland when they return to Minnesota and plenty more. Visit TickPick.com slash Insider today and use the promo code Insider to save $10 on your first order for Minnesota football tickets. Fans are going back to stadiums, so you have to be ready with the best Minnesota football gear. That's why you have to check out Soda Stick. I saw a ton of Soda Stick gear around training camp. I expect to see it in the stadium as well. There are so many cool designs on hats, t-shirts, and hoodies for the fall weather, including the John Randall design that is extremely cool. There's also the straight cash homie Randy Moss homage, can't stop the Thielen hats, and a personal favorite, the old video game designs The Tecmo fans will appreciate check it all out at sodastick.com that is s-o-t-a-s-t-i-c-k.com everything is screen printed here in minnesota and i can tell you that the shirts are comfortable and they last because half of my closet is now soda stick at this point again that's sodastick.com minnesota sports inspired goods and keep your eye out for our soda stick giveaways no team can afford to overpay for talent Build a championship team with Indeed, the smart way to only pay for quality candidates that meet your must-have requirements. When hiring gets hard, you need Indeed, the job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. Just attract, interview, and hire. In fact, with Indeed, you can do all of your hiring in just one place. Indeed knows how important it is to make the most of your recruiting hours and dollars. And with Indeed, you can save time and money by setting your must-have qualifications and only pay for the quality candidates that meet them. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through September 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Hey guys, looking for a betting advantage this football season? You need to download BetQL, the only app you'll need to compare betting odds and make smart bets. Their best bet computer model scans over 350,000 unique bets per year to give you a best bet recommendation for every game across all major sports and gives you the reasoning behind why you should place the bet. Their model covers everything from spreads, over-unders, and player prop bets. Don't want to use this model and prefer to do the research yourself? Well, BetQL has all the necessary tools for your betting research needs. Tools like line movement and sharp data on who the pros are backing, team summaries highlighting previous success against the spread and over-under, team lineup breaking news and injury status updates, and leaderboards to track how you stack up against others and to view your winning streaks. Better data, better bets. Head to the App Store or Google Play Store now to download BetQL. You can also head to try.betql.co slash bluewire to get started now. Enter the discount code BLUEWIRE at payment checkout for 25% off any of their subscription offerings. Make sure to check out their offers page to find a special offer to receive a full free year of BetQL. Don't miss out on the chance to gain your betting advantage during this football season. Does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows, you're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friend's login for the good stuff. 
Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream. And it brings you live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part? There's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. You know, I, I I think if we're trying to find like what the answer is to overcome the shortcomings that they have along the offensive line, there are some things that could improve, but some things that probably won't. Like Rashad Hill is not going to become a different person at left tackle. Uh, we could see Oli Udo improve. Maybe not body slam another guy at, after a play. He could probably learn from that. Um, we don't, we're probably not going to see Garrett Bradbury improve at this point. It's sort of after yesterday, I thought, well, you've had two full NFL off seasons to not give up four pressures and not commit two penalties. And that wasn't Aaron Donald. That was a good player he was facing, but it was not Aaron Donald. So that's not going to change. Ezra Cleveland, I thought, had a very tough day. He might be able to improve uh, a little. But that offensive line doesn't look like it's going away for as far as being an issue for this team. But on the defensive side, aside from Brashad Breland and a couple of big plays that went against him, they played pretty well. I mean, they gave up 128 quarterback rating to Joe Burrow. He made some great throws, some absolutely spectacular throws. But they also sacked him five times. And they also showed a little more pressure from other people other than Daniil Hunter, like you know Michael Pierce uh, getting two sacks and, and some other pressures that they sent from Mike Zimmer scheming them up. And I guess I walked out of there thinking – if you are going to survive this early tough part of the schedule, which after a loss suddenly looks tough, it looked very manageable before if you get the win, but now it suddenly looks difficult. And especially the way that uh, the three teams that they're playing against played in week one, it's really Zimmer and the defense. Again, it's kind of on them because as I laid out it, when it's shootouts, the Vikings don't win those games in recent years. And they don't have the offensive line to win those games. They need to be able to run first and put themselves in advantageous situations for the offensive line. So I think it comes down to, can you, as a defense, do enough to slow down Kyler Murray, to slow down Russell Wilson, to slow down Baker Mayfield, and get through this difficult portion of the schedule? Because after that, it's Jared Goff, it's Sam Darnold. You're kind of back in the game if you can just survive this. Uh, but I think it it's ultimately going to come down to you know exactly what Kirk Cousins will give you. So Mike Zimmer, they put all this money into your defense. Go defense. Well, I think Vikings fans got a nice uh, look to it, what Michael Pierce could have given them last year. Yeah, that's true. Um, yep. I mean, I, I think, did he say he only had a couple sacks in his career? Or three, it was a single-digit total? Three for his career, two, two yesterday. yesterday. Yeah, yeah, two yep. yesterday. So. And he's just a beast. He's kind of, you know, he's reminiscent of maybe Pat Williams and Kevin Williams and the Williams wall or a Tony Saragusa where he's kind of a presence and he's a disruption and he's, he's going to take two guys probably to block him. They're going to, the teams are going to try to avoid him. If he can contribute to pressure and sacks and, you know, Daniil Hunter, it took him a while to show up, but when he did show up, he also had a big play. Um, I think this is still going to cut. Yeah. Like you said, it's, it's a Mike Zimmer's team. It's going to come down to defense. It's going to come come down to pass defense. It's going to come down to the guys that he relies on, the Harrison Smiths. You know, Anthony Barr, just reading tea leaves, maybe inching closer to returning to the lineup, how effective he will be after a long layoff spanning two seasons. Uh, we're not sure. But I think these are key players. These are where the investments were made. This is where the commitment was made. It's where the coach's mindset and heart is. You're right. There's going to be a lot of – the Vikings are going to succeed. It's going to be 21-14, 16-13. These are the kind of games that they're going to have to win. And, oh, by the way, uh, we didn't really get a chance to talk about him much, but I don't know. you got to feel a little good about Greg Joseph rising to the occasion. huh? Yeah, I mean, here's yeah. a journeyman. Uh, I, again, I was preparing for uh, the calamity to come, as it usually does, in the kicking game. But he steps, uh, steps up 
and just drills, not once, but twice after the Bengals successfully iced him or tried to ice him and sneak it in before the timeout or before the kick went off. So he nailed that field goal twice at the end of regulation. They were trending toward another defining moment for Joseph in overtime, which I think would have been the ultimate. Um, look, there's still 16 more games for this to go off the rails. But I think that was one area where Vikings fans were holding their breath and probably Zimmer as well. Uh, that was resolved. How about your new punter uh, coming up big and keeping the ball pinned deep, especially with that kick in overtime? I think it was about 63 yards. Yeah, yeah. So special teams look good. So, like, you know, it, it, it's not like the leaks were everywhere on the ship. There were just two of them. Everybody knows where they are. Everybody's been spackling and duct taping it for a long time, and it didn't hold. And that's where this is going to play out week by week by week uh, until something really dramatically shifts that narrative. How about your new punter is not a line that I expected to hear <laughs> from Brian Murphy in our first Monday morning, Murph. But the special teams is better. The defense, one of the issues with defense in general is that it's weak link. And we saw this yesterday. They got a lot of good performances on defense, but one guy, and it wasn't only Bashad Breland's fault. They ran for 149 yards too. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't only him. And Michael Pierce even said after the game, hey, they brought me here to stuff the run. I didn't do a good enough job of that. We didn't do a good enough job of that. But overall you saw this defense is going to be much better. There's no question about it. It's just what the weak links are enough of a crack to open the door to where it's not going to be 2017. There were stretches of offense in 2017 where they weren't good and it didn't matter. They won a game in Atlanta like 13 to nine or something. And it just didn't matter because they shut down Atlanta's offense with their number one defense, and that was it. And you can win when you don't play well. I don't think they're going to be good enough to win when the offense doesn't play well, but I do think they're going to continue to be good if Bashad Breeland can you know, not have that day over again where, by the way, he had a 26 PFF grade. Um, that's about as low as you're ever going to see a cornerback ever get. He was targeted eight times, gave up 107 yards, two touchdowns, and had the key penalty. So that was about the roughest day you can have if you're Bashad Breland. Um, but aside from that, I think we saw a lot on the defense that Mike Zimmer was getting excited about throughout training camp, and it's a healthy defense. To me, that's the path. It's just you can't put yourself behind in any way if you're the offense. And now we're talking about a team with the second most expensive salary cap hit for its quarterback. And we're saying, well, you've got to stay ahead of the sticks with the run game and you've got to play defense. And it's just a it's just a weird place to be as a franchise. And I think that that always gets highlighted after a game like this. When you start the season, a game you should have won or, uh, you know, opponent that isn't all that strong that we all wrote down W's is. Like, where are you as a team when you don't win a game like this? Now, on the other side of the coin, there's some other teams, and I just wanted to get your opinion quick before we wrap up about um, the NFC North, which, oh, my gosh, like what hey, happened? Everybody's in first right. place. Right. right. Everyone's tied. Well, technically, the Vikings are in first place because of the point differential and the strength of opponent. Uh, but what, what did you make of the Packers just getting absolutely demolished? Well, I was kind of interested. I, I, I was really impressed with what uh, Aaron Andrews was able to get out of Rodgers. Finally, so a, a little bit of truth, uh, even though in the pregame interview, I don't know if you saw that or read some of the text on that. Although, again, it was it was classic uh, passive aggressive uh, Aaron Rodgers. I didn't really want to make a big deal in the media about this. Well, then, but your handler certainly did. And they made it clear through the leaks what your problems were. I think that's that's hanging over that franchise right now. Uh, I think the fan base is ornery. I think the management coaching staff are not thrilled with how that played out uh, over the offseason. And he looked awful yesterday. Now, there are several reasons he looked awful. Uh, but that pick as they were driving in the red zone, you know, terrible pass. Um, I don't Was it Adams that he threw behind? I can't remember who he threw behind on that 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 last pick there. I just I don't I, you know. The, so, you know, there's a lot of hand wringing going on in Green Bay right now. Detroit, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I mean, it was it was very exciting uh, what they were able to produce there in the fourth quarter, but ultimately uh, they lost that game extremely early. The Bears and Andy Dalton, I don't know. I don't see that. I don't see much there. To granted, now they're out in L.A. Uh, Rams are 
obviously psyched to have Matthew Stafford and, and also have that defense and have a full stadium. That could be one of the biggest home field advantages in the league. Um, again, it looks like it's all there for the taking. So maybe the Vikings can afford to get this mulligan out of the way. Uh, it is week one. We may be just kind of laughing about it uh, when the leaves turn and the snow flies, but if every team is going to have a mulligan in week one, well, then maybe the Vikings could join in and have that and feel comfortable in that. However, the stretch coming up, as you mentioned, at Arizona, home against Russell Wilson, home against Baker Mayfield, who even though they lost last night or yesterday to Kansas City, I, I, I take that guy in a knife fight any day. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like this has the potential, as everybody says early on, 0-1, shouldn't be a reason to panic but this Owen one feels decidedly different because it can snowball and also the way it happened I was actually thinking about this yesterday that if the Vikings switched results with the Packers I think there would be more there would be more freak out there would be oh my gosh we got killed by the Bengals but in a lot of ways it would be easier to just write off and say well look you know you clearly weren't ready and you, you got blown out and things went wrong fast. And that happens sometimes in week one. I once witnessed the Buffalo Bills beat the New England Patriots 31 to zero in opening week. And Tom Brady eventually raised that Lombardi trophy at the end of the year. So like that hap it happens all the time. that There's just a weird bizarro game. And OK, well, I guess you just write that off and move on. It almost felt worse to have a chance to win it after playing as poorly as they did and then not coming through with that, um, then it would have to just like, well, this game was a wash and, and there's nothing to even talk about here. So uh, it will be very fun to track with you all season long, Murph. And I'm glad to have your columns on Purple Insider. People can go to purpleinsider.substack.com to check that out. We'll be doing this reacting after every game here on Monday morning. Murph, aren't you excited, Brian? I am, and I even got in a WKRP in Cincinnati reference in no. today, and I was worried, like, you know, that's a 40-year-old sitcom. I don't know what the average age is of your audience. I hope they get the reference. I saw that you did, so maybe there's hope. Oh, I knew it. Yeah, I knew it. Yep. Turkeys uh, cannot fly. No, they cannot. <laughs> um, so I, I was actually going to ask you one more question. I'm sorry if you yeah, have to go right. or you have something to do today. Uh, I, I, I do, but I'm good. Okay. But, I work for you now, Collar. But the, I know, I know. So you're on here as long as I make you um, for, for obscene amounts of cash that I'm just heaving in the air and you're picking up off the ground. Uh, what, what should people want out of this season when we talk about it like this? Like, so everyone loses in the NFC North and last year's NFC East sort of flashed through my mind. Like, oh man, like what if everyone is sort of, fighting each other with you know pool toys or whatever in the streets over getting to eight wins or something like is that is that is that what you're looking for is it like win the division even if it's eight games is that a successful season like i, I started to think about that like what is a successful season well it's a, a successful season is a playoff berth no doubt what i want to see though is clarity can you succeed in this league with Kirk Cousins as your quarterback. Can you succeed in this league uh, by going to the run first? Can you win in the 16 to 13 fashion of, you know, three yards in a pile of mud? Can you do that in 2021 NFL? Can you have an old school coach and a, a longing kind of a general manager who's dying to, you know, shape his legacy and maybe get this team back to the Super Bowl for the first time in 45 years? Can you do that? Can you win with Cousins? Can you satisfy a fan base that is conditioned for uh, collapse all mm -hmm. the time? Yeah. Yesterday, all it does is fuel that anxiety. So that's what I think I, I want to see is, is this going to work with this quarterback and this regime and this scheme on both sides of the ball? Can that succeed? Yeah. And if it means nine wins or ten wins – Okay, fine. Now you're there. What are you going to do when it matters? I think what you need is clarity. If you get nine and eight or eight and nine, you don't get a lot of clarity. You get a lot of muddled picture, and then you got to make more decisions on the future. Uh, and that's on, that's going to be on ownership. So I think what you need is you need a successful playoff. I would say maybe a division win would help. Ten wins would certainly set a tone. Maybe get a home playoff game, or just you know five and twelve and blow it all up. 
But what you don't want is that mediocre uh, thread down the middle where you're still left with a lot of unknowns going forward. Right. Right. It's either do or don't like when, when something or burn it down, give, give us the answers to what this team is going to be going forward. Yeah, that's right. Uh, great stuff, Murph. Great to catch up with you and we will do it again after Arizona. Thanks buddy. Can't wait. I'm Andre Knott, and on my new podcast, Brownstown, I'm chronicling the sometimes sad but always hilarious story of the last 20 years of Cleveland Browns dysfunction. With the voices of Jim Donovan, Brady Quinn, Tim Couch, Romeo Cornell, Josh Cribbs, TJ Ward, Phil Savage, and many more, we'll track how unbelievably bad decisions and bad luck kept this team down for way too long. So join us as we go tailgating in the Muni lot and diving deep into the dog pound. You're going to Brownstown.